Then we went back and re-released the songs off the first album, Chicago Transit Authority. And the same people who told us we were so great and underground and progressive and all that stuff said we had sold out. Hey everyone, what's going on? I'm Katie Darrell. Today we are at home and social with Lee Lochnane. Most of you know him as original member of Chicago. Holy moly. How you doing, Katie? Lee, I am great. Not as good as you. Uh, you're part of the 100 million club. That means you, uh, uh, your band has sold over 100 million albums. Oh. It's you, Elvis, the Beatles, Iron Maiden. What the what? It's, uh, I, I would have never thought that when we started. And, and I don't think any of us would have that, that we could come this far or for that matter, last this long. Uh, Chicago's known as the rock and roll band with horns. And obviously you play a huge part in that, playing mm -hmm. the trumpet. Uh, how did you fall in love with the trumpet? My dad, when I was in grade school, uh, about uh, I was 11 years old and he asked me if I wanted to, to join the band and, and possibly play the trumpet because he had played the trumpet and there was one upstairs in our attic. And... Uh, I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And then I liked it so much that uh, in, in the next couple of years, I told him that I would like to do this for a living. And then he tried to talk me out of it. I think he only wanted me to play the trumpet. Him and my mom wanted me to play the trumpet to sort of have a, have a rounded life, you know, something in the creativity. And, uh, and then, but actually get a real job. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard that many times to, to go get a real job when, you know, you can't survive in this business. And uh, little did they know that uh, 55 years later, I'd still be doing it. What happened to that original uh, trumpet? Where is that? That is, I blew it out. It's, uh, I, you know what? I'm not exactly quite sure right now. I think it's in uh, a, a storage closet uh, in Sedona somewhere. I'm going to toss out some numbers for our fans watching right now. Chicago has had 21 top 10 singles, mm -hmm. all right, and 11 number one singles. Which is your favorite then and now? Uh, you know, these songs are so interesting uh, writing-wise and playing-wise that you got to keep your chops together just to play them mm -hmm. well. And uh, so why don't you refresh my memory as to what the number one songs were? Oh, shoot. Now you're asking me that. I thought you would know that. I'd have to Google all of them. No, no. I, uh, if you ask me what, what album a song is on, I'd have to Google it myself. We, we have a lot of albums. Well, let's see. I, I think uh, we've got If You Leave Me Now, obviously. Um... If You Leave Me Now was a surprise, for sure. Because that song was recorded, I believe, on the 10th album. And... The rest of the band, the the entire band had left the ranch except for Cetera and Gersio and I think Robert and maybe Danny. Uh, but I think Danny might have been gone too. Anyway, whoever was there, they recorded that song last. So the horn section for sure didn't hear the song until it was already had had uh, it was already on the radio, and and uh, that turned out to be our biggest selling and and uh, most successful song in the history of the band at that time mm -hmm. and uh, uh, however many countries there were in the world at the time something like 230 240 countries it was number one all at the same time so that was quite astonishing for us and uh, we were on the road when it got a, a grammy we were in in uh, europe chicago has so many accolades and awards um and success stories and so many of them probably did occur when you weren't able to actually attend, whether it be the Grammys or in the country right. to celebrate in your hometown when things right. hit number one. Right. Um, is that part of the bittersweetness of being in a band is you get the oh, success, yeah. but then you're celebrating alone and in, in an isolated location? We're always working. So we miss weddings and birthdays. And, you know, you, you hear a lot of those stories, but in order to do what we do, the audience is not going to come to us. You have to go to them. So that's part of the uh, the uh, what you got to live through to do this for a living. 
speaking of weddings, uh, with 10 guys in the band, you guys have a lot of songs that are quite wedding worthy. Do you get a lot of family members in the past asking, hey, uh, uh, you know, Uncle Lee, could you come and maybe like do that song? Do, did, did family ask for special requests of you guys to play because they knew you? Well, well, the band could never show up at because we were all working exceedingly, and and I have told every one of my relatives that when they set up weddings, I get invited, but I said please do not try to set it up so that you think I might be able to be there, because because inevitably they'll set it up when I'm not working and something will come up and I am always working. so. <laughs> you know, it never seems to work out. So I just send a present and uh, say congratulations and have a long life and happy. Uh, take me back to the naming of the band, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of gossip and rumors about how this song, uh, that, that how your name came about. Uh, right. Obviously, we know the band as Chicago. We know that you right. started out as the big thing. And at one point you were named the Chicago Transit Authority. Right. Did the Chicago Transit Authority actually send you a cease and desist letter? Yes, the Chicago Transit Authority did send us a cease and desist. And we just named the, the band Chicago on the liner notes of uh, the Chicago Transit Authority album. And uh, we entitled every album after that Chicago. So the one that became Chicago 2 was actually entitled Chicago. Chicago 3, same thing, Chicago. So each album, and the, the, the only way to differentiate, differentiate them was to put a number on them. So that's how the numbers came about. I mean, you know, we spoke about earlier that this is, let me show you, the 38th studio album from Chicago. It is called Born for This Moment. But when you think about it, it's, the number should be higher because so many of those original albums were double albums. Why was it important for you to put out so much music in bulk on these albums in the beginning? In the beginning, there were uh, unlimited copyrights that the, the uh, record companies were offering and uh, they didn't limit that until I think we did our uh, fifth or sixth album. They decided to only pay uh, on 10 copyrights per record. That changed the entire music industry because the writers did not want to share after they wrote 10 songs with the 11th guy, they'd have to start splitting up their, their shares of royalties. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with how the writing started going. And, the, you know, AM radio also only wanted three, half, three minutes to three and a half minutes so they could, you know, and that, that's when you, you learn that, that your music is actually an advertisement on the radio. And you can play the long versions when you play live. And uh, we did, but we were able to get away with in the beginning playing long versions of songs the entire in, in their entirety on the album and have it played on the radio because FM was just starting up. So we were lucky in that way. Chicago, definitely known for the harmonies and the horns. Mm -hmm. Which do you like more, the harmonies or the horns? Well, the, the, the horns have harmonies as well. So they're, they're sort of uh, hand, they go hand in hand. But uh, you, you mean like singing? And yeah, which which part do you enjoy the most? Uh, and and the, get the most satisfaction out of when you when you play a record back in here, which which gives you the goosebumps? I just love listening to music. And when it when it resonates with me, I can listen to it over and over and over again. And it's very difficult for me to get tired of listening. All right, all right. Um <laughs> let, let's go back in the past. So the band's getting started, right? And you're playing a lot at the Whiskey A Go Go Dude, which is so iconic oh. on the Sunset Strip. And you are opening for like Hendrix and Janis Joplin. Uh, do, do you have any backstage or side stage memories and moments uh, with either of those that you could share with us? Actually, when we played the Whiskey, we, we were the, uh, the headline act. Oh. And uh, yeah. And- uh, Apologies. No, not a problem. But we played with a couple other people as well. I, um, I, their, their names escape me right now. Jimmy would know in, immediately some of the other bands we played with. But we had a great time at the Whiskey. 
and we lived so close to it that we did a lot of rehearsals at the whiskey. So, so it came in handy for more things than just uh, becoming known and having Jimi Hendrix come in one night and see us play there. And then he asked us if, if we wanted to uh, be the opening act for him on the road, which was really cool. You know, uh, twist my yeah. arm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Hendrix. Yes. Uh, how do you manage a small stage like that? I mean, you know, ten plus people in the band and horns. Horns take up space, right? How? I mean, that whiskey the go go stage was very tiny. Um, well, they were all tiny back then. Yeah. We had a big band and small stages because that's what the clubs are, and uh, that hasn't changed. In fact, when we became headliners and started playing on 40 foot stages. We still set up like we were in a club. <laughs> Get away from me, dude. You have space it, over there. It took a while for us to start spreading out because you, you couldn't just move the amps around. You had to set it up. And we were very comfortable with the way we were uh, set up in the clubs. We could hear each other. Uh, the further you get away, the more uh, uh, there's a, a, a distance in time from when you play a note, if somebody else is 40 feet away on the other side of the stage, it gets there a little bit later. So it's harder to play in time. Interestingly enough. Yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um uh, got, I mean, when, when you think of Chicago, you also think of some of those ballads and oh, you guys yeah. have some great ones. Um, what what's the status and with uh, Peter Cetera? There is no. He's there is no retired. status. Would, will we ever see the band, uh, you know, and uh, the players from the past ever get together? I doubt it because, you know, like I said before, we sort of moved forward and uh, yeah. everyone who has been replaced has been replaced by somebody who plays as well or better than the previous guy. So the band still sounds great. And in fact, I think it sounds better than we ever have right now with the, uh, the, the newest members. The thing that really sticks out to me is that three of us, were with the band day one in 1967, February. And that's me, uh, Jimmy Panko, and Robert Lamb. So that's half the band because there was only six of us at that time. That was before Satara even joined. I think I read on and this. I love Wikipedia because it can be so spot on and so right. far off. And on oh, yeah. Wikipedia, it says that you, okay, that you are the peacemaker and problem solver of the band. <laughs> Do you do you feel like that's true? Where are you the uh, problem solver and peacekeeper? I don't know. I think we all have a hand in it. If there's a problem that comes up, we sit down and discuss it. Or if somebody gets so so angry that they leave the room, we go drag their ass back in and uh, work it out. And uh, or just let them get over it and come back the next day. And we, you know, it's like it's uh, it didn't happen. And uh, we sort of move on. We clear our head and and uh, what's next. Here we go. Well, I mean, exactly. After so many years together, uh, there's got to be a point, especially with with maturity and, uh, you know, comes wisdom that you can probably uh, brush off a lot more. And just so you guys, it's not worth it. Like, I don't know if it's brush off or just realize that if you want to keep doing it, just, you know, let it go. Don't worry about it. And uh, uh, it, it's important that we keep our minds focused on what is important and that's the music and the audience without the fans we would have nothing you know there's nobody to go miss the uh, weddings and birthdays for lee the latest album from chicago is called born for this moment mm -hmm. obviously it's a fresh release um if you had a time machine and you could release a another brand new chicago album would yeah. you want to go to the past and drop it in a special year or do you want to move it to the future? Where would you drop in your time machine? The next I Chicago wanna, album. I, I want to move forward. I want to do something that is a natural progression uh, forward for us. And that's what I think this album actually did because, uh, and, and it also stayed the same in that there are many different styles of music within the one album. And we've always done that. That's something that has never changed for us. Uh, the things that we get criticized for are uh, joining the singles. In fact, when our first album came out, we were uh, underground successes, especially in Europe, more than America even. 
we went over to uh, Europe on our first tour in 69, I believe, and uh, we were stars. It was shocking to us. And um, uh, we were critic way ahead of our time. Oh my God, these guys are great musicians, blah, blah, blah. But AM radio wouldn't play the songs that we were releasing. Uh, does anybody really know what time it is? Beginnings, question 67, 68. They didn't want to play them because we hadn't had a hit yet. So we had to wait until our second album came out, uh, Chicago 2, and uh, they had interest in the ballet for a girl in Buchanan, but not the whole 14 minute piece. They would not play that on the radio. So they liked Make Me Smile, which was the very beginning movement. And there's a reprise at the end. They cut out all this music stuff in the middle and put those two together. And that was our first single, Make Me Smile. Then we went back and re-released the songs off the first album, Chicago Transit Authority. And the same people who had told us we were so great and underground and progressive and all that stuff said we had sold out. We hadn't changed one note, <laughs> same songs. It was pretty much, so we had, to, we had to really take a look and go, listen, uh, I think we should just sort of worry about what we do because they changed their mind and nothing had changed. So pretty bizarre story. <laughs> The latest album is called Born for This Moment. Lee, thank you so much for hanging out with me and sharing the stories of Chicago. Um, I, I'm still impressed. I mean, th the success that this band has seen over its years is just astounding. So uh, congratulations and thank you for sharing these moments with me. Thank you very much. Hey there, thanks for watching Access TV. Subscribe, follow, like, and do all the good stuff. And make sure you leave a comment below. I don't know, just let us know what your favorite Access TV show is or who your favorite bands are and what artists you're into, or just say hi, man. I'd like to be told hi. We love hearing from you, that's the point, all right? Keep it coming.